Praise the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? We just want to welcome each one of you uh, here uh, this morning. And uh, enjoyed the testimony that we received from Pastor Nube yesterday and just in some of his evangelism ministry and that uh, a Hindu person got quite radically saved and was baptized the same day. So um, we rejoice with him and we also are a supporter of him and his ministry. And so we rejoice in that, that we have a part together with our other missionaries that we support. There are three other families we support as a church who might not say so. And uh, together with the school, the Christian school that we run here. And Sunday's is a, a quiet day, <laughs> and, but a day where we can just rest uh, in the presence of the Lord and hear his word. So we want to welcome you uh, yeah, this morning, and I would invite you to turn with me in your Bibles um, to First Samuel chapter 30, verses 21 to 25, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 21 to 25, then I'm also going to touch on Romans 12, verses 3 to eight, a few verses from the old and some verses from the New Testament. Uh, this is one of the accounts of uh, David, before I go there to give a little context. Um, now David's base, if you like, was in a place called Ziklag. Uh, and at the time David was not yet king. He was being pursued by Saul, uh, and he had to, for many years, uh, since he received the prophecy and the anointing to become king by Samuel, he actually was pursued for 13 years. So uh, God's promises are yes and amen, but his timing is uh, different to our timing, and he knows the right time. But anyway, this was... At a time, and there was a season that, uh, for a time, that David was actually among the Philistines. Um, and uh, he was out with them and campaigning uh, under the present, pretense that he was fighting the Philistines' enemies, but in reality he was fighting Israel's enemies. And, but nevertheless, um, he somehow had left the base camp uh, with the women and the children and their possessions while he was out and busy there. And um, that wasn't a good thing, as we'll hear in a moment. But to give you a little context, but what happened is the Amalekites, a band of Amalekites came and attacked David's base camp. And at the time, the Bible says that David had 600 men uh, with him besides women and children. So he was growing. And God was adding to him, but the Amalekites came in and they took all the women and children. They didn't kill anyone, but they took all the possessions and everything and uh, fled. And uh, when David uh, came and the men were so upset, it says, and that they were uh, calling upon the Lord and crying, so much so that they wanted to, and I'm just giving a little background, so much so that they wanted to stone David. Uh, but if you read the account from the beginning here, it says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. And that's a good thing to do when we've got problems and we feel under attack or under opposition, then we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. But what happened is when they came and David inquired of the Lord uh, if he ought to, there was a prophet in the Abathar, a prophet in the midst, uh, should they pursue the men and he got the go-ahead uh, to pursue this band of Amalekites. And uh, so David took his 600 men, but on the way it says that 200 of the men became so wary uh, because obviously they were uh, going full flight uh, that they couldn't continue anymore. And so David said to them, look, we'll stay. Stay actually with the possessions. And they did so, and the rest of the 400 went on and they actually defeated the Amalekites, and they repossessed everything. Nothing was touched. Uh, all of the 
uh, women and children, the wives and all of the possessions, and they even received more from the enemy as well. And so let's pick up the story in verse 21. It says, now David came, this is obviously on the way back to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they had also made to stay at the brook Bezor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men. So some of the people with David, it says were wicked and worthless. Now God is always sifting and refining us as his people. In fact, the old version says men of Belial. And that means worthless or wicked and worthless men. Of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, We will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? And maybe you want to underline this or remember this, but it says, But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies, they shall share alike. And so it was from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance in Israel. And so here we have a situation, if we could imagine a army today and there are those who take care of the base camp, Uh, there are those who cook, Uh, there are those who do maintenance, who maintain vehicles, Uh, there are many things, Uh, there are those who see that all the infrastructure, who handle the logistics, the supplies and, and they don't go out onto the battlefield, but yet they are part of the same army. And somehow these people of David, uh, these wicked men or worthless men, it says, believed that they were better than those who had stayed in the camp or to look after the possessions as David had commanded them. Not something, they weren't cowards or uh, they went out in the beginning, but not every one of us is the same. Would you agree? Not everyone is endowed with the same physical strength and physical bodies, for example. And so there was no unwillingness on the part of the 200. It's just that they physically could not go further anymore. And David graciously recognized them and gave them a task to look after the supplies. Now, we've been speaking about having a vision for the church walking worthily and Last week I shared that the Bible says there are different gifts, there are various ministries, uh, ministries of services, wherein we use those gifts, and then there are diverse or various operations or activities. I gave a few examples just to remind us. The Christian school, for example, is an operation where we employ different gifts, we employ different skills. There are different ministries happening. We are Christian based school. Um, There are many others. There are are mission organizations. There are churches maybe involved in different various operations, and we appreciate that. We had the Logos Hope ship a little while ago, and we got an opportunity to go on there. I trust that you may have also. And that is a ministry. A, a certain type of ministry or operation, if you like. Um, but this morning I want to focus on how we see ourselves, because obviously these men saw themselves as better, more deserving than the others who had stayed with the supplies. If you're joining us on the podcast this morning, I want to Warmly welcome you. We know that some work as well, so bless you when you get an opportunity to listen as well. And may his word transform your lives. 
So we saw a type of, even in those early days, and even before that, there were different opinions, and the Bible speaks a lot and at great length about this, and I've been sharing on the book of Ephesians and touching on Corinthians, where it says as much, you know, we're not all the same. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Okay, the mouth say, cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Uh, and rather those parts that seem unseemly and which we might consider less, we ought to bestow more honor if we're speaking on the diversity of the body of Christ. In fact, even local churches, we are a local church, we're involved in various ministry, differ from one another because there are different ministries, there's different operations, and these are given by God. But I want to help us this morning and to help us to find out how we can successfully interact with one another as the body of Christ. And that starts by how we value or see ourselves and how we value and see another or others. And I can tell you, if we can grasp this truth today, it's going to take a lot of pressure off you. <laughs> it's going to give you a very, very good understanding. And therefore, the whole account that I read, and is virtually a whole chapter devoted to this particular account, but the, the outstanding truth there is just this, that as he, the reward of the one who goes out to battle, the one who plants, <laughs> And the one who waters, the one who stays by the supplies, are the same. They've got different functions, but they are equally necessary and equally important. And I want us, as we continue to help you and help me, to value ourselves correctly in the sight of God. And that's what we're speaking about uh, this morning. And before I go into Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, and then I want to share just a few aspects of this, um, I just want to say, don't let your setbacks define you. You know, David, as a young man, had many setbacks. He had to learn much patience. He had the vision, he had the anointing, but yet it seems the opposite was happening. But God was preparing him. God was helping him, and he does the same. His principles are the same for you and for me this morning. If I look back on my own life, I can see that, and I'm sure you can as well if you consider that. But don't let your setbacks, we will, we will have setbacks as Christians, and that's for sure. But don't let them define who you are. And that's important this morning. But let's go to Romans 12, verses 3 to 8. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone, listen, the Apostle Paul here acknowledges that there is a grace, there's a measure of faith, there are gifts and abilities and ministries given to him by God. I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. And this verse I really want to focus on this morning, as with the story of David there. For as we have many members in one body... But all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering or service. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts, or the, the other word is, the word exhaust means to strongly encourage. He who exhorts 
in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so we have some examples there this morning. The body of Christ does not consist of mavericks. Another word for a maverick is an individualist. And sadly, there are many who drift around. They go from here to there to everywhere else, uh, often feeling it is their right to criticize, to stand in judgment of the church and the pastor, but never settling anywhere and making a positive contribution. Listen. The body of Christ, and as we've been sharing over the past few weeks, is we are connected to each other and we are connected to the head. The Old Testament and New Testament always speaks about a people of God. That in the New Testament is called the church. There's also local churches. There's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippines, uh, Philippines, uh, Macedonians and so forth and so forth. And these churches had certain workers. They had certain members who knew one another, who ministered to one another in the various gifts. Even Paul submitted to the authority in Jerusalem and was later sent out by a multicultural church in Antioch. And his ministry as an apostle was to take the gospel to the Gentiles or non-Jews, if you like, But bearing in mind that we are true Israel today, circumcised in the heart and not the flesh. But there were specific local churches that people were called to and who functioned together. They were connected to one another or ought to be connected to one another. And as I said last week, that whatever one does, it affects everyone. If we are an encourager, we love others, and we go out of our way to bless others, you know it affects the whole body of Christ. But if we are unavailable, if we are impure, it affects the whole church. As Paul had to rebuke and correct the Corinthian church for allowing certain things, gross sin in their midst without dealing with it. So what the one does, whatever the one does, it affects the whole. My commitment affects your commitment and vice versa. The body is connected. The Bible knows of no individualists or mavericks. We are connected and interconnected with each other. So, the question is this morning, in light of the word, how can I function successfully as a member of the body of Christ in relation to to other members. And this is not an easy thing to do because as the Bible says, we are diverse. (laughs) We are different. (laughs) You have a different personality to me and I have a different personality to me as well as to one another. Some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts, some of us are quieter people, we worship in a different way, not any less. Some of us are more flamboyant and and act outwardly spoken, if you like, and demonstrative. But we are different, and God has made us that way. Our fingerprints are different. And as in the last decades, science has discovered is that our DNA is different. We are unique. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But how can our function successfully as a member in relation to how I see myself and how I see others in the body of Christ. I want to share four thoughts here on our passage this morning. And for those who are listening by the podcast, you know where we're going with this is number one is appreciating that who I am and all that I have is from God. Firstly, Reminding myself and coming to uh, the recognition that all who I am and all that I have is from God. Number two is to have a healthy and balanced self-esteem. 
The third aspect I want to share is to see unity in diversity. In other words, we don't all have to be the same to be in unity. And number four is the use of your gifts. The use of your gifts, ministries, in various operations. Let's start with the beginning. Appreciate saying who I am and all that I have is from God. The Bible tells us that everything we have is given by His grace. The way we look, the shape of our bodies, my height. And Jesus said, who of you by worrying can add, you know, to your height? Or these days we wear high heeled shoes, you know, to try and get that right. But, you know, if our hair's curly, we want it straight. And if it's straight, we want it curly. And uh, if we've got a darker tone, we want a lighter tone. And if we've got a lighter tone, we go into sun to get a darker tone. <laughs> but God has made us special and unique. And, you know, as I've grown, and I'll like use the word older. Mother, we're not old, are we? We're just more mature. Um, but you, you get to recognize that everyone is beautiful in their own way. And I've, you know, I love children. And I guess that's why we've got a ministry with children. We always have had. And everyone is special. And, you know, you get to know the children. And everyone is special. And I tell them that when I minister to them as well, that you are special. But all that we have, our looks, our families, our children, our position, our work, our skills, our intelligence, our intellect, Everything we have, without Him, we are nothing. But through Him, and especially when I recognize who I am in Him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Grace means His unmerited favor. I cannot earn it. I cannot buy it. I don't deserve it. It is given freely to us by God. Job. Job is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. <laughs> I know it's a, he went through tremendous suffering, but in reality it was a relatively short time compared to all of the years he lived under the blessing of God. Some say theologians tell us it was about nine months. But he went through tremendous Suffering and persecution, lost everything. The Bible says he was the purest man. He was an upright man. There was no fault in him. Listen, he did nothing wrong. He was a wealthy man. He owned sheep and oxen and he had ten children, seven sons and three daughters But he lost everything. Later on, he was attacked again and came under sores and boils and everything. But the Bible says through all of that, he never sinned. Listen to his response when he heard the news and that how raided as it come and burnt his house and, and he lost his children and died. It says, then Job arose, tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's why I love that song so much and we sing it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When the sun is shining, or but when he gives and he takes away and Job... No wonder he was blessed. He understood these great truths that everything he had was from God. And we find that the prophets knew this, the apostles knew it, and we need to come to that same understanding as well. I remember as a young man um, listening to a pastor, and we were having a men's breakfast one day. We used to have a lot of that sweet waters at the time, many, many years ago, and and the speaker said something that I've never forgotten. 
He said there's something within each one of us that makes us think we're better than the next man. <laughs> there's something, and that obviously comes from the flesh, there's something in each one of us that makes us feel better or believe we're better than the next person. But that is of the flesh. It's a wrong thought according to the Word of God. And we see this error with the men of David. We see it in the New Testament as well. But if we want to relate successfully to one another, we need to first recognize that all I have, I'm not more spiritual than someone else if I'm a Christian. Okay? Uh, I'm not better in that sense. I may think I am, but I'm not. I'm gifted differently, but all that I have is from God. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The only thing we can take from this earth is our character formed in Christ, and we will as his own go to him and those we have won to the Lord, those we have influenced for Christ as his children, as his body, that'll be taken. Those good works in Christ, that'll not be burnt. Every possession we have. And sadly, many times, the body of Christ, I'm speaking generally, not all, is so geared to the material and and everything is geared on the, the, the possession, the health, wealth, and happiness, and so forth. But the true lasting things, the reality is we cannot take any of these things with us. We can only take the legacy that we've built, the legacy of Jesus, built in the lives of others. Listen, Church of God, family of God, let us build things that will remain for eternity that you will be richly rewarded for. God knows our needs, and I'm not uh, suggesting, I often say this, you know, God will bless us, as we, I think it was said, read by Jocelyn, we seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. He knows about all the things we need, he'll take care of you. Number two, this morning, Having a healthy and balanced self-esteem. The word self-esteem means the way we value, the way you value yourself or see yourself. And I can tell you this is a big issue today in terms of social media, in terms especially of young people, not only young people, but I often need to encourage and, and teach the students, especially the teens, in regards to this, because they form their self-esteem based on the amount of likes they get, and they tend to start comparing through social media, and there's things like cyberbullying and, and all of the sort of stuff that goes on, and statistics tell us that there's been a serious rise, a major increase of mental health problems, things like discouragement, depression, chronic depression, and all of these amongst young people. Why? Because they are forming their value through what they're finding from others, their peers, on social media. Spotify, well not Instagram, I think you know better probably than me, Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all of these sort of things that there's quite a number of platforms. But this one gets more likes than that one. In fact, sometimes I... Now, now look, I'm not knocking all social media. I believe there's tremendous value in it, especially for people far away and we can communicate and, and stuff like that. But we should never form our self-esteem. In fact, sometimes I think it's just a brag platform. <laughs> Hey, look at what I've done, and look at what we've done, and this is what that, and you find that. Wow, you know, this is. And for those who don't have that blessing, if you like, they can feel and believe that they are someone less. 
And I often remind the young people, and we all need to be reminded that we are special. We need to evaluate ourselves, not by the opinions of others, and I don't mean that we shouldn't take constructive criticism and have mentors and people in our lives. That is very valuable to tell us the truth, that we can get better. But where we're forming opinions of ourselves by how I look, I'm not as beautiful as another, or as handsome, we've got a serious problem. We need to appreciate our value in what the Word says about us and how God sees us despite what other people might say or think about us. There are two destructive. Having a self, healthy and self, balanced self-esteem. I'm watching my time here. What are we... No, okay. Um, there are two destructive attitudes we can find commonly among members of the church. <laughs> I'm only speaking to the church here this morning, mainly. And as Paul says, I speak to the church, you know, he says, unbelievers, God will judge them. It's not my business to... <laughs> so, um, but we find this in the church. Two destructive attitudes. I've seen it time and time again. Probably you have as well if you think about it. We find commonly among members of the church a superiority complex, number one, destructive attitude, and or an inferiority complex. So you get those who think they're superior or better than others. Very spiritual. (laughs) Tend to judge and criticize and compare and boast. And we know that attitude, the Bible says, is stemmed from pride that goes before fall. That's why David had to correct his men and said, listen, brethren, you're brethren, but you're doing some worthless things, yeah? Now, who's going to support you in this? It's God who gave us deliverance, everything we have from him. And who made you better than another? So the first superiority complex relates to spiritual pride, arrogance, which will always go before fall and ultimately lead to destruction unless we repent of it. This person thinks that they are superior or better than others, that somehow they have earned their body, their intelligence, their looks, their rank, their family, their wealth, their possessions, Everything they had, they think it's because of them and they don't see it as being of God. It can be very subtle, but its source is pride. That others are best and inferior to them. I want to say something Jesus came for the lower caste, predominantly. Doesn't mean wealthy people can't save, but. But he came for them. Ephesians 4, 7, 8 says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned, and he gave gifts to men. The second destructive attitude in terms of self-esteem relates to fear and unbelief. On the other side, we have, oh, the little old me, I can't do anything, I'm not worth anything, I'm less than everyone else, and some of the traits of this person is I can't. (laughs) Others can do it better uh, than me. Fear of failure, unbelief. Think of the ten spies. Only Joshua and Caleb said, we can do it, our God. God will do it. (laughs) The other ten saw giants' problems and they lost out on the inheritance that God had for them. They put, in fact, they made the whole congregation fear. That's why I said what one does, whatever we do, we affect each other. We are connected to one another and connected to Christ the head. So the second or inferiority complex relates to fear and unbelief. It cuts us off from realizing our full potential and flowing effectively in our gifts and ministry. I'll give you an example of the ten spies. Another example we have is the man who was condemned 
with the one talent who for, from fear hid his talent. Yes, he didn't have as many talents, but God wasn't bringing him account for the number of talents. It was bringing him account because he didn't use the one he had. I fear that you were, were a strict master and calling those things into being that were not. And he never ever used his talent. You see, God gives to us severally as he will. Instead, the Bible calls us to sober thinking. So if you look at superiority complex and an inferiority complex on the other side, the Bible calls for a sober thinking and valuing of ourselves. Let me just read that again over there. To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now let me just say something. Note that word more. It doesn't say not to think of him or herself highly. It says more highly than he ought to think. There's a, there's a difference there. To think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. I can tell you when we come to the place to, to see who we are and to appreciate who we are in relation to others, man, that leads to such contentment. It takes the pressure off that I don't always have to compare with someone, I don't always have to try and be like someone else because that's the whole problem. And I always feel I don't have to aspire to be like some movie star and, you know, all of these people that are paraded uh, uh, as ideal people. But if you look at these ideal people's lives, you'll see brokenness, misery, suicide, drugs, alcohol, because those things cannot save them. We don't have to do that. And that's why Jesus said, love other people as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you can't love other people. You'll be broken. To think soberly means not to be high-minded, listen, without being small-minded. It means not to be high-minded without being small-minded. And I like that definition there. It speaks of a true and thoughtful evaluation of ourselves in light of God's Word. In other words, the way He has created us and sees us with thanksgiving for His grace. And as I said, this, if we can lay hold of this truth this morning and just see that we are special, we are unique, and we don't have to compete with one another as a body of Christ as members, but we can complete one another. There's a big difference. So knowing this enables me to not define myself as others may see or even myself may define me but rather to define myself as God sees me and who he has created me to be. Now, I, as a pastor, I don't have to compete with others. We have a ministry. Uh, I love preaching the word. We, we love children and we minister a lot to children. And someone else might do something different. It, it's Okay. You know, I can pray for them and I trust they pray for me. I'm just giving, using myself as an example. Paul said the same to the Corinthians. You know, they had the same problem. We follow Apollos, we follow Paul, we follow Jesus, we follow Peter. <laughs> and Paul had to say, who's, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? Who's Peter? We, we are servants. We're given different graces and ministries. But it's Christ we follow. It's Christ we follow. So Paul didn't fall into that trap. But we are so prone to comparing and competing. And indeed, our ministry, some have a predominant ministry within the body of Christ. And some have a predominant, I use the word predominantly, ministry to outsiders. One plants, one waters. They are both essential. Thirdly, this morning as we wrap up, is seeing unity in diversity. You see, God hasn't ordained that we all be alike. 
In fact, science confirms that. I've given a few examples. We are, we are really different. Uh, no one, we are unique. Okay, so, but God has created us all different, but all special, unique, as part of his body and his great wisdom, which we cannot even begin to fathom. Why does it, but that's the way he does it. But these all work. We all work together for a common goal for the good of all, for the profit of all, for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. You see, God has a grand plan. Um, just let me jump back to the story of uh, Job. Uh, Job knew who he was. David knew who he was and many others. And when he came under attack, he didn't give in. Yes, he complained <laughs> like we all would do. Um, he found it uh, tremendously difficult but you know, he only went through what God allowed. And he hung in there in the midst of it all, I think around about chapter 15. And I mean, he had been accused by his friends and, and falsely accused and all sorts of things that he was unspiritual, that he had secret sin, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, by these people who thought they were better than him. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the end, I'll stand before him. It's interesting that the devil did not, was not allowed to touch Job's wife. Listen. Even Job's wife later criticized him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job rebuked her and said, you're sounding like a foolish, ungodly woman. Don't do that. And shall, we, shall we complain you know, when we go through difficult times, shall we not accept the bad with the good? But God did not allow Job's wife to be touched because already the seeds, listen, of success were there for the future because God blessed Job doubly. He had twice as many possessions he again more sons and daughters, seven sons and three daughters, and it says there were no more beautiful women in all the land than Job's daughters. <laughs> One of them's name was Karen, and Michelle's second name is Karen. And she's beautiful, like your children are beautiful. Okay? We're all special. But you see, even in, 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 in when it seems like there's defeat, that the enemy is getting the better of us, already the seed is there for our victory in future. Because that wouldn't have happened to Job if the wife was killed by the devil. Jesus said, unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But within every seed, it's the outer part that dies. There's an embryo or the germ, if you're talking about wheat. Within the heart of man is a seed, the spirit that lives forever. And that's the sobering thought. The Bible says we're either going to live in one where when the body dies, or the spirit returns to God and everyone will give an account. We're either going to be in a glorified body before the Lord with rich reward and glory uh, uh, in eternal happiness and joy and peace. But sadly, and we need to evangelize more, there are many destined for hell. But there's already planted a seed. You see, our bodies are dying and fading away, but there's a seed left within us for victory. From the moment we're born, the seed of victory is already there. Finally, the use of your gifts. So if we want to successfully interact and see ourselves with others, 
We need to appreciate who I am and all that I have is from God. Secondly, we need a healthy and balanced self-esteem. In other words, sober way to look at ourselves. We need to see unity and diversity, that we are in fact different, but we work towards a common goal. And then finally this morning, the Bible speaks of the use of your gifts. So having then gifts differing, differing according to the grace that has given us, let us use them. And what is the use of having talents and gifts and ministries and, and if we're not using them? And last week I said, what good is a hospital if it's not using or healing any patients? You can have all of those gifts and skills and great skills and, and positions and everything like that, but if no one is getting healed, what good is the church if it's not the light of the world? What good are we as individuals if we're not the salt and the light if we're not bringing healing to others? We need to recognize who we are, whether we have abundance of gifts or maybe only a few gifts, it doesn't matter. We need to use them. We mustn't compare with the other, we need to use them. This may sound obvious, but when you discover your gifts and learn to appreciate who you are in Him and begin to walk in them, it invokes the blessing of God on your life. I remember my old pastor used to say, Pastor Ferdy Warwick, he's 18 now, still see him sometimes. <laughs> he often used to say that the happiest, most content people in all the world are obedient Christians. He said the most miserable people, discontent, criticizing, judgmental, <laughs> are disobedient Christians. Those who do not operate. And I know this message may not gain me brownie points, but that's okay. It might not get me likes, but that's okay. It's the Word of God, not my message. It's the Word of the Lord. Let it be a challenge. Let us, uh, I trust that this message, and I'm done, will inspire us to appreciate who we are. Yes, I may not be this one or that one or the other, but I don't have to try and be like them. I can emulate the example in Christ and learn from them, but I don't have to be like them because I'm created different. And I don't have to compete. I'm here to complete others. And in that, it just takes the pressure off. The young people here today I want to encourage you as well. Uh, you might not always get so many likes. Maybe you don't, don't feel you as good looking or... Don't worry about it. <laughs> See yourself. See yourself as God sees you. Know that you are created by Him. You are special and you are created for a special purpose. Let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mighty hand upon us. We worship you, Father. Father, may we recognize and think soberly about who we are as we seek to gain a deeper insight of the wonderful body of people called the church. And thank you that we can be part of the church, members connected to one another, connected to the head. Help us to grow, to appreciate, to learn, to discover more of who we are in you and what you have given us, and that we can be a healing to the nations, that we can build one another up, and that we can be a healing to those who do not know you out there. So I just speak this blessing over the family of God. I thank you for each one this morning. I thank you for the diversity. Maybe some have gifts that we don't always see just like our internal organs, but are vital. So I bless them. I bless each one. May we continue to grow into the full measure of the stature of Christ, Father, as we consider these things. We ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. And I'm going to invite the music team, worship team, up this morning. And maybe I can ask uh, Damlin, would you help us just with the offering today? And uh, 
Marva, would you help us with the offering? Um, just while you come up. First of all, I 